All right, we're live. Welcome back to another edition of The House That Allen Built. I'm Scott K. Martin. With me, as always, Greg Vollmer. And today is the first episode of Season 2 of The House That Allen Built. This is Episode 1, Season 2. Okay, so... Nothing much week has one, changed between last season and this season. Well, yeah, you're not right we're next we're to just, me for starters. We're just separated by a few miles. Yeah. Have we calculated the miles? Is it like... 2300 or some stupid 1800 whatever uh it's a it's a lot it's too much it's okay it's okay so obviously the week one matchup is the bills on monday night it's going to be the uh the premier primetime game because it's 9 11 in new york city aka east rutherford new jersey and it's aaron Rodgers, new york jets versus josh allen's Buffalo Bills. Last year, the Bills were 13 and three. And um, one of the big headlines is going to be that DeMar Hamlin not only is alive, but he has made the roster and will be backing up Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer, along with, of course, Taylor Rapp, who we got from the Rams in the offseason free agency. Uh, so, what do you think? What's the bigger story? Aaron Rodgers, Monday Night Football, playing in New York. Uh, you know, Mr. No Hard Knocks himself, or is it guaranteed comeback player of the year, Damar Hamlin? I mean, the bigger the bigger story is Aaron Rodgers in New York. The uh, look, the bigger the, national the, story, but the bigger yeah. story should be that Damar Hamlin made a hell of a recovery, and he's on a roster. He's he's with the Bills, just like I suspected, and I'm happy for him. Yeah, no, I'm I'm answering honestly. I'm 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 I, I didn't answer as a Bills fan there, I suppose, but I'm answering honestly. The the bigger storyline is Aaron Rodgers. That's what's gotten all the national media attention this offseason. The Bills went from being in favor with the media, and I'm telling you, it comes around full circle. What's going on with the media in a way is kind of what happened in the 90s, where the first couple years the Bills made it and the, they were the media darlings. Once they stopped once they showed that they couldn't get over the hump, they turned into the the the, the opposite. It's kind of I can't quite make the comparison because we haven't made Super Bowls, but in in the way that the media is reacting this off season, it's kind of like that. They they're almost all wanting to hop off, uh, except for a select few that are still staying staying strong on the Bills bandwagon. A lot of media members, it's the popular option to hop off of the bandwagon and kind of make the trendy pick which is now the jets now demar hamlin the the cool thing about that story other than the fact that he's still living and he's got a chance now to like as he said fulfill his his dream of of having a, a long successful career as a safety in the nfl he earned the spot it wasn't just something where it was it was media driven or it was the the coaches felt like they had to do it to avoid some bad pr it wasn't that he they the, the coaches i think were hesitant about how he would react mentally coming back on the practice field and he showed in the preseason games that he had no hesitation there was no mental hurdles he probably had to do a lot of, like behind the you know off the the camera but when the camera was on and the games were going he showed no hesitation so he earned every bit of that roster spot so i do want to say that but as far as the big media narrative it is going to be aaron Rodgers first game as a new york jet it's just the way it's going to be we don't like it as bills fans it's 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 it does it sucks because well that's all we've had to hear all off season and that's why i think bills mafia is so hyped up for this game and we want to try to send a message like don't forget about us but it's just the way it is the bills had the, the bills were that trendy thing we we've fallen short in pretty sh ridiculous shitty ways much to our own doing whether it be coaching or what have you but and so now we got to try to take back the well, not that we have to take back the narrative from the media but if we want to prove something then we, we show it on monday night yeah absolutely there's no doubt that the bills have been kind of like put aside and they're no longer that that darling story and you know to go from super bowl favorites last year to now like not even winning their division through many people's projections because aaron Rodgers, who yes he's been in the league what 18 years this is his 19th season but we have to remember that last year 
was by far his worst season. He had 12 interceptions. He had nine total interceptions in the previous two seasons, and he has four league MVPs over those 18 years. I get it. He's great. But will he be? Even though Nate Hackett, his best friend, Nate Hackett, comes over after them spending three years together in Green Bay before Hackett got promoted to Denver and then got canned after 15 games. They're back together. He knows the offense. It's not like he's going into a new system. So it might not be as rough as some people think. So obviously the national media, especially the ones in New York, are like, it's their Super Bowl year. They're going to make it. Now they've got a lot of talent. They've got, you know, rookie of the year, Garrett Wilson on offense, and they've got rookie of the year, Sauce Gardner on defense. So they're they're pretty loaded. They've had a great draft the last few years, actually. And they've got a good offensive line. Uh, they're shaky. I say good, but it's really actually the defensive line that I'm more worried about with uh, Quinn and Williams. But anyway, the Bills... They returned 75% of their roster from last year, which is actually the most in the league. You know, we see the turnover. We see the wide receiver room a little different other than the top three guys. And we wonder, what does that mean? You know, the Bills spent a first-round pick on Dalton Kincaid, tight end slash maybe slot receiver. And he looked great in, in the preseason. I'm excited for him. Um, I think that they're going to do great things with him maybe right off the bat just to prove that that first round pick was not a reach and that um it, it's going to set a precedence for the rest of the season what do you think how did sam laporta look on on thursday night sam laporta looked good i think he was one of the only weapons that the lions had outside of Amon Ross St. brown I, I, honestly marvin uh is it marvin lewis no, no marvin lewis no, no. Was for the bengals marvin jones marvin jones he Jones. returned to Detroit to play for them again, but he didn't. Obviously, he's lost a step, and the passes weren't perfect. It's Jared Goff, who's, you know, a decent quarterback. He had, you know, that he's going on the most consecutive passes in NFL history without an interception. It hasn't, he hasn't thrown one since like week nine. Yeah. yeah, I think he's got week third nine. most in history now. Yep. yep. Jared Goff, he's unheralded. He's a little bit like Kirk Cousins, he's a statue in the pocket. <laughs> he doesn't have the mobility like the kind of the must have quarterbacks now in this day and age of the NFL, but he still gets the job done because of his smarts, because of his anticipation and because he will hang in the pocket like a Kirk Cousins and take the hit before he delivers the ball. But to, to your point, they are lacking wide receiver star power. It was kind of a one trick pony there. Like they were kind of figured out after a while in that game where they, they kept on doing that kind of cross the field slant to the sun God, but there's only so much time they're going to have to get away with that before teams start to cue on that with Amon Ra. Um, I, I think if anything, seeing how Sam Laporta played on Thursday night gives me, even though I, I'm going to temper the expectations because of how good of a defense we're going up against Monday night, but it gave me a lot of excitement, even more so than what I already had about Kincaid because seeing Sam Laporta come in immediately and get, well, he got almost six and a half points in fantasy, which <laughs> sounds like nothing, but if you play fantasy football, the way the tight end landscape is six and a half points for a rookie debut on a team is, is no joke. You're um, talking PPR though. And he I'm did talking, have yeah, what? I'm talking PPR, but he, and he got receptions and he got no looks really in the second half. It was all mainly the first half. I thought Sam, Laporta was going to get targeted in the second half and they really went away from it. He blocked a lot and he was on a high percentage of the plays on offense. Anyways, I'm excited about him in fantasy. And I think that seeing him do so well in his opener makes me think that the sky's the limit for what we're going to use Kincaid for this season. I, I won't say that he's going to put up more than six points against the Jets to open up because it's a tough defense. Way, I think way more difficult than the Jets are, or than the, the, the Chiefs are. But just kind of looking at it, all this this talk about tight ends don't produce right away. We have a pretty rare class of tight ends that were just drafted in the NFL in 2023. Oh, no doubt. There's what they said, like five. And really, there's eight tight ends that are fantasy eligible, like somebody that you might actually even want on your team. Laporta is one of them. Now, he's obviously near the top, but they're not the same tight end. Laporta is more of like a true blocker i think even though he can catch he's very athletic and he proved he can catch they're not going to be asking the same from kincaid right off the bat kincaid's obviously more athletic but he's a, a thinner build 
and he's got those sure hands that were like the best in college. So I feel like they're going to use him in the slot while they can because who do they have otherwise? They have Hardy and Sherfield. I hope and, I hope we don't use them like they use Sam Laporta uh, on Thursday night. I hope we don't have him block as much. Like I I would love to see. I would love to see Knox in the in the kind of traditional tight end role, and then him in the slot, like a, in a Beasley position, because that's what I think we all want. I, well, speaking for Bills Mafia, I think most of Bills Mafia wants to see him as more of a wide receiver. Where, again, I want to go back to fantasy. It, that's the perfect situation because then he's like this hybrid role where you've got this this position in fantasy that's kind of dying in the tight end position. And if you can, oh, get it's not dying end. anymore. It is not. I think the tight end position is actually making a comeback because of people like this. They're going to change offenses. Yeah, well, Looking at the Bills' can, offense is going to be more twelve personnel, for sure. Yeah, if you can have a tight end that gets used more like a slot wide receiver, of course that's going to be a fantasy cheat code. And if the connection between him and Allen is what it seems like it was starting to build during preseason and and training camp, then maybe shoot who knows what's going to happen by the end of the year when we're hopefully hitting our stride and you've got four weeks to go and you're in crunch time and you're trying to seal up maybe a division uh you know seal the division and and hopefully try to buy for a first round buy it's going to be really tough because we're going to still have the chiefs and we're going to have the jaguars in a really weak afc south um and the Bengals aren't going away and the broncos might make a comeback so you know, there's at least half of the AFC that could easily make the playoffs and not surprise anyone. We know that. Um, and the Bills, who have been consistently back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back AFC East champions now after 18-plus years of irrelevancy or mediocrity, uh, is kind of being threatened by the Dolphins and the Jets. And that is legitimate because the Bills split series with Miami and the Jets last year. Now, will that happen again this year? Maybe. Maybe the Bills can go 4-2 and two and still win the division based on overall record and, of course, AFC record, and they have a hell of a schedule, a very tough schedule. But I, I still believe that Miami fans are a little too confident, where Jets fans, they've been pumped full of all this confidence. They have a great team. Their defense gave us a lot of trouble last year. Two of Allen's worst games, obviously one being a loss, but both of them, uh, with the Bills averaging 30-plus points a game last year, I think they had like 18 average between the two um, times they played them. So, yeah, I just don't think that the Bills can sleep on them, and I don't think they will. I think they'll be ready. Obviously, you see all the offseason drama with Diggs. He looks happy. He looks like he's hungrier than ever he's aggressive in practice he, he's got a, another level that he's entered because he wants them to win and he knows that last year they kind of overlooked him in the playoffs the bills that is they didn't utilize him the way he wanted he was upset rightfully so now are there a lot of wide receivers uh -huh. to get the rep thought. for prima donna yeah i know but you would have thought I, that him getting upset at the end of that season would have turned into what it did this offseason that's true that's true i mean especially when i remember the 2021 playoffs where he's got his arms at his side and he's watching the, the Chiefs celebrate the AFC and, and go to the Super Bowl. That was that was very tough. And I hate seeing the annual playoff Allen gif, you know, or image of him red and upset. I remember the Houston game. I remember obviously the Chiefs game and then most recently the Cincinnati loss. And it's like when are we going to get over that hump? A lot of people I wanna, think, you I know what? See him, I want to see him red in the face from drinking some of that brown water he's got stored on his top shelf after winning the Super Bowl. I don't want to see him red because of of another embarrassing loss. Yeah, that's a good point. I, You know, we're going to have to do a uh, fireball for fireball. Brown water. Speaking of brown water, you see that Bill's logo right there? It's pretty faint, but you can see it. For those listening and not watching, he's got some whiskey in a glass, I assume, with the Bills uh, emblem etched in the glass, which is pretty fancy. Some benchmark whiskey. Oh, shout out to Natalie Forstell. She's, uh, I hope I said that right. She is a follower of Rob's, actually, and she follows my stuff, too, now, I believe, because she knows I do a lot of the work for him. Uh, so if she's she's uh, in the comments. We I didn't promote this, but it was one thing that she said she saw on her feed, probably through Facebook, because I did just share it. But... Nice. 
Anyway, um, shout out to Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. And shout out to Rob as well. Rob and Scott work together. They put out some really good stuff. Great content. Yeah. Oh, she did say that that's how she saw it. So cool. Okay. All right. Well, we are here to talk about week one. I, as much as I want to talk about the entire season and break down every game and, and you know, the AFC and all that, we could honestly be here for a week straight, but we won't do that. Um, we're doing this live. We haven't really done, but what, two of these, one in person live and then one live um, that we tested it out. Uh, yeah, uh, it's remotely. weird because like we were we're obviously comfortable doing this together now after having what you could call our our inaugural season last year. And we kind of got the kind of um, we had, you know, it was a little rough to begin with. And then we kind of came into our own doing the podcast and and then me moving away kind of put a, a little bit of a curveball into things and, and trying to figure out how we're going to do this now remotely. But um, so we're, we're it's it's kind of like a. Even though we're we're in our second season, it's kind of like restarting again in a way. Um, yeah, because it's going to be a different format. Obviously, I didn't have the crazy little zinger intro that we normally do. We still yeah. said the same things, but I'll have to work on those. I do have an OBS system where I can do that. But for starters, we're doing Google and YouTube. And if I have to edit this for uh, posting through Buzzsprout for all the podcast listeners, um, we are on all the major platforms. That's uh, what is it? Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and um, Amazon Music. We're on Audible. Yeah, you know, well, not Audible. We're we're not reading books. But um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this matchup has two very good teams. Um, I mean, there is a chance that three out of the four teams in AFC East make the playoffs through the wild card and such we'll um, see. isn't that interesting like you talked about you you brought up the whole nathaniel hackett thing and then let's go back real quick let's rewind a year ago nathaniel hackett goes well he goes to the broncos to become the head coach everyone speculates the media speculates that rogers is going to follow him to denver instead they get russell wilson the media thinks that the afc west is going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread ends up falling apart the wheels fall off the wagon we all know what happened nathaniel gets fired you know rest is history now yeah now he ends up on the jets as a coordinator now rogers goes to the jets it's just wild how things played out there and and now the media is hopped on the media was all on the broncos last year now the media is all on the jets now there's some people being like everyone saying that the afc east is going to be like what they thought the afc west was last year and a lot of people think that maybe the Jets are going to go into flames like the Broncos did. And I would say pump the brakes. I I don't think so. I, I think that Rodgers wasn't healthy last year. And if he stays healthy this year, he's still very potent. Um, here's, here's where you have parallels, though. This is where there are similarities. So you bring in a new head coach. Obviously, Robert Sala has been there for two full seasons. This is his third. McDermott's three and one against him, by the way. Uh, and we have started against them three of the last five games or seasons in week one, which is a crazy, um, yes. <laughs> crazy thing. Yeah. But, I'm glad you brought that up. I didn't know that until you told me, but I do think with Wilson, Russell Wilson going from Seattle being traded to Denver for too much and him falling flat. And then you have Sean Payton come in and go, Holy crap, Nathan or Nathaniel Hackett screw this up. Now, obviously, usually coaches don't say that about other coaches, but it's Sean Payton. And he's coming back in after, really, he wasn't fired from New Orleans. He stepped away and came back and is making good money, and maybe they'll make a difference. Maybe he can resurrect Wilson's career. But with Aaron Rodgers, he's been in the league 18 years. This is his 19th, where I think Russell Wilson is entering year 12 or 13. Uh, it's a little different, but he also brought in – his receivers where uh denver didn't get to do that you know like they didn't get to bring over Lockett or metcalf or you know the oc it was just wilson so he had to go into his system however it was hackett was there for 15 games it didn't work out i think hackett being an offensive coordinator he's a lot more suited for that position i think sometimes head coach is too much for people and mcdermott he's going to learn if calling the 
plays on defense is going to be too much for him. He he actually in uh, in the preseason had somebody else help him with the play calling just to see what it would be like to balance. And he, for the most part, I mean, the guy's defense is going to be a lot more aggressive than Leslie Frazier, and the players have clearly God, spoken that. Only hope. So it, it, it should be a hell of a matchup. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, it's good to have – Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer back last year. They they played in what two games together, maybe, and then uh, Poyer was was out uh, with injuries, and then Hyde was out for the year with his neck, which there was a scare. He has been upgraded this week to a full participant from a, a mild back injury he had. He said it might have been from playing around with his son, but that's literally the only injury to report. Other than obviously Von Miller starts the season on pup. And we knew that first four weeks, he he said he was pretty much ready, but he also said he was going to play last year, and he didn't. So he's always putting hopeful. Him on pup was, putting him on pup was the only move. That was it the really only, was. Mind, that was the only move. Yeah, it's smart. I mean, why why use him in the first four weeks? Like we, I think we can handle them. Possibly, uh, we we face the Raiders week two. We don't need Von Miller for that. Week five is when we play what the Bengals, I think, or. We need him back for for that week five. Let me let me find out who we play week five. Do you know? Uh, it's going to either be the Giants or the Jaguars. Um, we go we go to London, and then I believe then we host the Giants Sunday night. Okay, so I have it. We've got the Jets in New York. Then we have Las Vegas, uh, the Raiders at home, and then we go to uh, Washington. Then we host uh, the Dolphins, where it switched from last year, where it was that whole heat fest. Then we go to London week five. So that's where he would come and play his first game, like you said. But they're, week they're, five. they're thinking that they won't put him in London trying to, to travel and have him a debut there. Yeah. They're thinking it, it'll probably it, be the Giants. Yeah, the Giants is the next week or or New England. And yeah. I think coming back week six or seven is probably smart. And if you think about it, he got injured the same game that Trey White came back from a knee injury. Now, his wasn't as bad, but they both went out. Uh, they were out for the year. They had to rehab. And it sucks that they played, what, 10 snaps together? So this will be the first time we have all of our legit starters out there, minus Tremaine Edmonds. We lost him in the offseason. Um, but we did fill that spot with uh, – um, I always screw up. There's – Bernard and Benford. I think it's uh oh, it's uh Bernard, Terrell Bernard. He is going Terrell to Bernard. be the starting inside linebacker next to Matt Milano. So right away, he's he's calling the alignment on defense. He's got to be more vocal. A lot of people thought maybe it would be Milano, but that's he's an outside linebacker. He's, I mean, he's a middle linebacker, but he's still an outside in our in our system, and he's not as outspoken. He uh he leads by action, not so much by words. And a second-year player who was injured last year, who was also injured in the preseason, we haven't really seen him. He obviously – what does that say to you about uh, Dotson or uh, or our other backups um, but with him coming in, not even being able to play, and, and Bernard gets it? Uh, to me, it says that our plan for replacing – Edmonds was kind of just throwing darts blindfolded. The, yeah. I think I don't know. I'm hoping I'm hoping that that's not going to be something that bites us in the ass this year, where we're, we're the whole narrative after a game if it didn't go well or something went wrong on defense is, well, fuck. If we would have just paid Edmonds, you know, instead we instead we paid. Um, instead we paid Oliver, you know, and I don't want to say that that's going to be a narrative, but it is kind of something that I thought about in the off season. We let Edmonds walk and then we paid Ed Oliver about the same amount of money that we would have paid Edmonds. Um, so I'm hoping that they have a plan. They did bring in, who's the veteran that they brought in from the Texans? Oh, Kirksey. Yeah. Yeah, Christian we Kirksey. Kirksey. We brought in Christian Kirksey to put him on the practice squad, but that's like a little too late. Like you're doing that, bef like right before we're getting ready to kick the season off. It just seems like 
I don't know. It seems like they were kind of just like, well, we just we we lost Edmonds and we know he was the quarterback of our defense for the linebacking core. We'll just see what happens. It kind of had that vibe to me this whole offseason. Um, I mean, they weren't going to pay 17 to 18 no, million dollars a I know, year. I know. I know it's a lot of money. Uh, I just think I'm not I'm not discrediting what we have behind after after Edmonds left. I'm not discrediting what we have. But it's kind of it's kind of like a mix and match kind of a feeling like, um, so I don't know. Well, are they going to just go with who has the high hand? Like, what if what if he struggles to to open the the season? And then uh, it's just, it's an, it's interesting how the whole situation has been managed. I will say. Okay, so if he struggles, they will elevate Kirksey, see what he has. And I mean, he obviously has played in the league for quite a while. He's been the starter in Houston. He's been a captain. He's just getting a little older and obviously is much older than Tremaine Edmonds and nobody has that pterodactyl wingspan that he has. Yeah. So it's a, it's a rare thing. I mean, I watched getting, that Lions getting game. Older, getting older is what scares me. Um, you got the, the, Von Miller. The, our defense is older for sure. I mean, we, we are pretty is almost in his mid thirties coming off of two major knee surgeries. You got Hyde. Um, employer, they're both 32, I want to say, or 31. Yeah. Which they're, they're both, you know, they're at that age where you just never know when, when it's going to happen, where you start just having things that pile up. Um, and that's again, not wanting to put pressure on things. Cause we know how things happen when there's a lot of pressure put on us. I E last year, when we went in to the open the season, remember, remember how awesome it was. Thursday night, opening up in L.A. against the defending Super Bowl champions. Everyone and their mother all offseason for six months. All we heard as Bills fans was, you guys are Super Bowl favorites. You guys are going to go to the Super Bowl. Well, we are going to see you there. And and it all came crashing down. And, and That's why you can't, no matter what happens this week, you cannot assume that that's going to be what happens for the rest of the year. I mean, look at what happened yesterday or the other day. The Chiefs lost to the Lions in the home opener. Is it really the end of the season for them? No. Obviously, they had Chris There's Jones out. That. Yeah, good call. Yeah, I've got a... Uh, to the Lions. To the Lions beating the Queefs. Cheers. Cheers, Mike. Cheers. I actually got the Labatt. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so, our safeties. Sure, they're 32. Our outside linebacker slash defensive end is 33 going on 34. In general, I mean, they're not that old, and they've they've drafted and kept their guys. I mean, they, they've tried to replace Dane Jackson, and it didn't happen until recently. And then it's like, okay, yeah, maybe we'll go with Christian Benford. It's, it, Look, you the, just, whole, the whole our windows closing narrative, we can brush off as Bills fans, and I've done it. Until until we can no longer brush it off. If we don't get it done this year, if we don't get it done in 2024, if we don't get it done, what are we going to look back on? We had a we had a Hyde and Poyer in their prime. We brought in a Von Miller, kind of a risky thing because he already had that knee injury before we brought him in. Unfortunately, gets another one on Thanksgiving the year after Trey White. Trey White even. How, is he going to get back to all pro level? I'm just saying yes. It, it. Yes. The whole, the whole narrative we all hate, hate it as bills fans of the window closing. Cause Burrow famously said the window doesn't close as long as I'm the quarterback of the Bengals. Yeah. The window doesn't close as long as Allen's the quarterback, of the bills, but you can say that until if we're two, three years down the line and we still haven't won the super bowl. And if we don't ever win the super bowl under Allen and McDermott and, and Bean. Well, that's a clear fail if we don't. And, I then, mean, then, then that's when it, then, then that's when all that stuff is true. Then then it was a window and it did close. And Poyer and Hyde did turn thirty three and thirty four, and then did what a lot of other people in that age do when you've been put through the ringer for that long playing a game that's not meant for humans. I'm just saying, yeah, the the, the window. Dude, without... their, their replacements are on the roster. I think Demar Hamlin is good enough to actually replace them eventually. And yes, he had some loan assignments last year. And they allowed some deep balls when Hyde and Poyer were out. Nobody replaces them, which is why they were the best tandem in the league and still are. You've got Taylor Rapp, who's literally 25 years old, and Jamar Hamlin, who's 25 years old. Yeah, Bean, Bean think, can try to work his, his magic as a GM, and he's done a great job. But And maybe 
just maybe Kair Elam gets his head out of his ass and becomes a legit CB1 or 2. Uh, he doesn't need to do it right off the bat. Some people don't pick up uh, the the playbook or the scheme as well. In his case, as much as which which is ironic because when he was drafted, he was like, oh, I brought my playbook on the airplane. But he's actually not meant for the Bills type of defense. I think they drafted the wrong corner. I like him. They drafted the right personality, but maybe the wrong player. We'll find out. Maybe he can adapt. It's, I mean, they are look, athletes. I don't want to compare. I don't want to pair, compare cornerback position to quarterback position. But look at the the 49ers. They lucked out by getting Brock Purdy in the last pick of the draft, Mister Irrelevant, to save their asses because of the Trey Lance disaster. We kind of and out by getting Christian they, Benford in the seventh, and and then we we he ends up being better than the guy we took in the first because he was clamoring about how much he looked at his playbook all the time. No doubt. I mean, Benford was a sixth round pick versus a first round pick, and that's five rounds. Out. But like you said, Brock Purdy. Look at what happened with with uh, with the Patriots when they drafted Brady. He was a sixth round pick too, and Drew Bledsoe was their starter. He got hurt. Brady came in. Oh, it's this young guy from Michigan. What can he do? Well, he only led them to six super what nine Super Bowls and won yeah. six of them. Let me say one more thing about this this window because it's it's a it's a kind of a generic sports talk talking point. And I don't want to touch any more on it after this, but the the Super Bowl window without Hyde and Poyer being in their prime, and without a Miller or without a Trey White in his prime, yeah, we know Allen can't do it by himself. No one can, even when he does go into Superman mode. Do I think our playoff window is ever going to close with Allen? No. But our, I do. I'm starting to think that our Super Bowl window will close with the, without some of these key pieces, and that's why I do get nervous. And it sucks because you don't want to have that pressure. Because we like, again last year there was too much pressure, and so I don't want to make it the make or break feeling going into this year. But my God, like I think our playoff window will never close with Allen, but our Super Bowl window, if we don't have yeah. some of the pieces we have, will close. Okay. So with that being said, Joe Burrow just. Signed an extension through 2029 at 55 million dollars a year. When Josh Allen signed his extension, people were losing their minds. How can you pay a quarterback 43 million dollars a year? You know what? Each year the uh, cap will go up, the brand deals go up. YouTube TV now has uh, Sunday tickets, so there's more money as a kickback for the players in the league, and it's only going to go. So that $55 million now is actually going to be good for the Bengals. For us, $43 million to keep uh, Allen for, what, another six or seven years? I mean, it looks great. So Big baller bean, we, baby. Now, there are things we can say, like, maybe it would have been better with Justin Jefferson instead of signing Stefan Diggs because we gave away that pick and then some. Sure, but what it could have, should have. I actually liked how aggressive they went because they were going all in now but they didn't do what the Rams did where they go all in, win a Super Bowl, and then the next year fall flat. No, they won the division again. The Bills have made the playoffs, aside from the Chiefs, the most in the last four years. They're the only team that went or to go into the playoffs each of the last three, four seasons consecutively, and the Chiefs are the only other one. I think we're the only team, too, that's had to play the Chiefs for the 10 out of the last 15 years in, in the <laughs> arrowhead. Oh yeah, we played it twice like we've had a year to play for the them last in three years. For the last decade, we well we play them in the playoffs, and then we play them in the regular season because based on where you finish, you know you're the number one in your division. If you're playing that conference, that division, or whatever, and I then know you pick, how it works. I just don't yeah. like how it works. It sucks. Well, then we have not to not only beat the then you know what then I'd rather lose to them in the regular season, obviously, and win in I the hope, playoffs. I hope or, you know what? Win both. Are crying in your barbecue this week? Enjoy that L. And get ready because you're going to go on down to Jacksonville next Sunday, and you better not go on two Chiefs fans. Let's see how y'all are acting up if you go on two. Keep up that energy up. Yes, yes, yes. So we keep getting sidetracked. This podcast is not about the Chiefs. It's not about the rest of the league. It's only about the AFC East and the Bills playing the Jets. So it can be about my hatred for the Chiefs. Oh, that could be every episode. It can be infused, but right now we got to talk about Alan Lazard, Miko Harmon, Randall Cobb, uh, Garrett Wilson. We've got to talk about that backfield they have where we're going to see our 
James Cook versus their Delvin Cook. Now, really, we always say like Josh Allen versus Aaron Rodgers. They're never on the field at the same time, but it's their crew, you know. And Delvin Cook is going to have to step up and get more carries because Brees Hall is coming back from an injury, and I think they're going to. They said that he's a full per- participant and all that, but I think they're going to have him on a on a pitch count per se. And I think that Delvin, who's been the bell cow in Minnesota for six years, he's going to be the lead back. He's used to a high volume. And I think uh, that no matter what happens in that game, they have a crowded backfield. I mean, they still have Michael Carter. They still have – they just drafted Izzy Abanaconda. Or Abanaconda. Abanaconda. Yeah. Abanaconda. Is it Israel Abanaconda. Izzy. Okay, so – Obviously, they have a good backfield, and last year they had James Robinson who ended up getting hurt, but they were being aggressive then too with their trade with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, we have to deal with Brees Hall, who was a second-round pick last year, and I think he's a stud, a true stud. He got injured. He had that season-ending injury. but or his I, knee I, on my birthday while he was on my fantasy team. Yeah, happy birthday to you, right? Yeah. So – their offense, right? They've got this Hall of Fame, first ballot Hall of Fame quarterback. They've got studs for running backs. They brought over Delvin Cook. They've got Garrett Wilson, who's a true number one wide receiver, offensive rookie of the year. He's legit. Um, they have a great team. And now you get to their defense and you've got Quinn and Williams. You've got all these other guys that are just so good. You've got Soft Gardner, defensive rookie of the year, like I mentioned already. They are loaded. There's a reason why they're getting all the hype. But I still think you got to remember the Bills are finally back to full strength and don't sleep on them. You know, don't sleep on them. Now, if we're going to get into the injuries, like I said, hi. Is Trey White going to cover Garrett Wilson? I don't think that he's going to shadow him one-on-one, but unless they feel like they need to, I think if Wilson ends up in the slot, you've got Taron Johnson. If he's on the outside, maybe it's Christian Benford. Maybe they bring in Elam once in a while. Maybe they're – You know, they'll switch it up. Dane Jackson's still a great coverage guy. Um, I think that we won't know until the game starts. It's literally the first game of the season, so there's no true pattern as to what they're going to do this year. And with Mekhi Becton back, who was the 11th overall pick in 2020, he's never played in front of the Jets fans. He's played in one game in 2021 uh, where he got hurt, but it was on the road, and he's been out for the last two years. So... He's a freak of an athlete. He's big, um, strong, athletic, but he's been fighting these injuries, and now he's actually, I think, got a shoulder injury, and then he came down with an illness. So he's still on their injury report as limited. So he may or may not play. He probably will play, but who knows? And then they've got Dwayne Brown, who's a 38-year-old, coming off of a huge knee injury. He was on the pup in the preseason. Uh, There's question marks. There's question marks. So I feel like... Our defensive line, our, we we need our ends, Rousseau and now Floyd, Leonard Floyd, who we have. Um, we need them to do well and blow them up. And I feel like Becton and Brown versus Rousseau and Floyd will be one of those matchups that we should be paying close attention to because that could make or break us. I drafted Garrett Wilson in my fantasy league, and I'm, I'm a little ashamed of it. You know, a lot of Bills fans would be like, you drafted Garrett Wilson over – overtaking Stefan Diggs. Like, come on, why aren't you going to be? Wait, right? wait, wait, wait. Diggs was already gone when you picked Wilson, right? Oh, he probably was. Yeah. He probably cause, was. Because yeah. half of the league we're in with you is, is Bill's fan. So, um, cause, cause yeah. he went number one. Did Josh Allen go number one? And then Patrick mm-hmm. Mahomes went number two. Correct. Yes. Which yep. in a 12 person league. And if in you a play 12 person, usually you don't quarterback go one, two. That's pretty fucking bizarre. Um, but yes, I took, I took Garrett Wilson because he's been going up against Sauce Gardner all training camp, and Sauce Gardner uh, is iron, iron sharpens iron, right? As Sala said in Hard Knocks, yeah. And and look, it's gonna. I I think part of the the shitty part about playing fantasy is the conflict of interest. Like I don't want to have to cheer for Garrett Wilson, and I'm not going to be cheering for Garrett Wilson Monday night. But he's going to uh-huh. get – he's their number one target. He's going to get targets. He's going to yeah, do but, something. But when, when I was doing the draft, he was the person I wanted because, yeah, the, he's just – my God. He put up – the numbers he put up with Zach Wilson and 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 White and uh, Mike White, like, are you kidding me? You have the chance to bring in a Hall of Famer. Um, Yeah, Garrett, Garrett Wilson is a stud. He's legit. Brees Hall is legit. I think the cream of the crop, you know – It'll rise to the top. I think. I think at the end of the season, it, uh, speaking speaking from fantasy terms, Brees Hall is the the guy you should want. 
I think Brees Hall's knee is going to be just fine. It wasn't as severe as Javante Williams' tear. There wasn't as many ligaments. Um, I think that Dalvin Cook is going to deal with injuries like he's been dealing with. I think it, mm-hmm. I think it's going to kind of prove. I don't want. I hate to say it because I want running backs to get paid, but I think that the Vikings are going to kind of be like, this is why we got rid of him type of a thing. I think he's going to be a fine complementary role, but there's going to be something that happens where he's probably not going to stay healthy. Uh, I think well, it's if you're if you remember last year, Delvin Cook, we held them to under what two point three yards per carry or something, and I was at that game, and, and then, then he, he ripped off huge. that 60, 70, 80 yard or whatever it was. Now my memory, mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah, uh, he he's an inch shorter than his brother. He's twenty pounds heavier. They're both fast. Last year he still had over eleven hundred yards rushing, almost twelve hundred yards, and eight rushing touchdowns. And then in the receiving game, you know he's going to get some. He had thirty nine receptions for two hundred ninety five yards and another two touchdowns. Yeah, can can James Cook do that? I feel like last year with only eighty nine rushes for five hundred yards, he can do that. His five point seven yards per carry probably won't hold up again this year. And only two rushing touchdowns because when we we're in the red zone, it was usually Josh Allen or he threw it to Knox or someone. But 21 receptions for him, 180 yards. I feel like we're going to see more of James Cook doing the same thing that Delvin did. And that is in the red zone, maybe. I, but then you've got Damian Harris who's going to suck up a lot of those carries in the red zone. I feel like James Cook, with his speed and yards per carry, will get us from the 20 to the 20. And Harris and all the others will do the dirty work. In the red zone. I'm excited to see. I'm excited to see how James Cook's yards per carry averages out with more touches this year. I do well, think it, it's his not, first year as the lead back because there's no single single carry, <laughs> right? Yeah, single well, carry, single carry. Carry's role. Yeah, for so. sure. Yep. Now he was a second round pick last year. It was our highest drafted running back in a long time, um, out of Georgia, and the younger brother of Delvin, of course, uh, who went to Florida State. Um, I don't know. I feel like our run game, we don't need what what they have. We need what we have, and we're going to do just fine between the two of them and and Latavius Murray in the backfield. I feel like our three-headed monsters will be just fine. Obviously, they got a lot more physical with the other two backs, knowing that Cook is a little undersized and more shifty. That's why I think between the 20s is where he's – mostly going to be utilized whether it be the passing game he could even be out there in the slot we saw him do it last year but i don't don't, anyway i don't think james cook is as talented as dalvin cook um and i hope i'm proven wrong this year i think i think that the system that dalvin was in for a long time with the the vikings was was way more run heavy than will ever be and dalvin does have a little bigger build to him than james so I, just being a realist, I don't think that James will ever reach the kind of numbers that Dalvin had. Again, I hope I'm wrong. Um, but yes, he's, pro- he's, he's probably going to have eight to 900 yards rushing yeah, and maybe 200 be, yards receiving. I think he's going to show why we drafted him. I think he's going to show those bursts of talent, kind of like CJ Spiller showed in his time with the Bills. I think he's going to show those moments where, where it's like this guy is flashy but I don't think there's ever going to be the volume just based on the kind of offense we run. And, and uh, again, he's a little bit lighter, um, but I'm excited. I'm excited to see how he takes over as our RB one quote unquote. Yeah. I, I think he will be, whether it's RB one a or B or just a true RB one. Uh, I mean, Harris has injuries in the past and we, so it's best for him to be uh, a backup or a one B anyway. So, I'm excited to see it. Um, any other matchups you want to see other than our Connor McGovern versus their Connor McGovern? Yeah, but but like clearly, clearly the Jets do have a better backfield than we do as far as running backs. I think yeah, that's, yeah they have they have four guys that could easily start. I, on, and I think it's going to be teams. it's going to be Brees Hall and probably it's probably going to be Brees Hall and even a, a Banacanda that are going to end up being like the main guys at the end of the season. That's just what I'm predicting. Yeah, uh, maybe quite maybe possibly. Bam. Maybe Bam, Zonovan, Bam night. Oh, that's right. Yeah. All right. So our um, offensive guard that we got from Dallas, uh, Connor McGovern, I think he's good. He's going to be our starting guard. He's 6'5", 318, you know, big guy in his fifth season. We're going against the Jets' Connor McGovern, who is their starting center. They were a little little confused when the Bills actually signed Connor McGovern. They're like, wait, what? We lost our center? But – uh, anyway, they, he's a little smaller. He's an inch shorter and like 
12 pounds lighter, uh, but they're both offensive linemen. Uh, their center has been in the league eight years, so or it's his eighth season. Uh, that's a, just a weird matchup, and I think that a couple other things I noticed when looking at the roster, they have a Brees Hall and a Bryce Hall. They've got two Michael Carters, one on offense and one on defense. It's like, God, if you're yelling out someone's name, you have to have Michael Carter the third and Michael Carter. You have nicknames. Bryce and Brees, and yeah, there's a bunch of different ones. But yeah, I remember the one year we had seven Williams on our roster. We had Aaron Williams and Kyle Williams and all the other Williams. There were I don't even remember. I can't name them all right now. But anyway, do you have any other matchups? What do you think about uh, McDermott being three and one against Salah's uh, New York Jets team? Obviously, he was Salah was coaching with Wilson and other quarterbacks. Where now yeah, he's got. Yeah, let me bring Rogers. that up real quick. Let me bring that up real quick. So yeah, the Bills are seven and three against the Jets since 2018, but the quarterbacks. In that span were Sam Darnold, Josh hmm. McCown, maybe it's you remember Joe it. Flacco, yeah. and then Mike White, and there was a couple other guys that played maybe one or two games. I'm not going to mention them because I just didn't want to write it down. Fitzpatrick. Need no, that was before that span. Th that's so true. That was it was. But okay, but, but he, we'll give yeah. it, well just just for the sake of it because they still he had a quarterback carousel. Yeah. It, it is never. Uh, there's never a time that isn't a perfect time to give out a Fitzpatrick shout out. Um, yeah, so it so, should be our running joke all season to mention Fitzpatrick every episode. Yeah, yeah. Didn't he? Didn't he go to like Harvard or something like that? Stanford. He did go to Harvard, and you know what? He's in commercials yeah. talking about it with Kevin Hart. Oh, the smart yeah. guy who went to Harvard. What That's a, too much yeah, Fitz what magic. That's too much what magic. A legend. Oh my god! I want this. Makes me want to go put on my Fitz Magic jersey. All right. Okay. Yeah, so this, seven and three since we had a hodgepodge of quarterbacks that we went seven and three against, but like they're not. They're not Aaron Rodgers. Like, and again, we can try to be like Aaron Rodgers will fold. Like, uh, like everyone thought. Again, I don't want to make the comparison, but everyone thought that. Russell Wilson was going to come in and make the Broncos an instant contender. And then they were like, Oh, that, that ship sank fast. It's, I don't see the same thing happening with Aaron Rodgers coming in. And a lot of people are like, well, look what happened when Brett Favre came in with the jets that didn't go so well. Well, I mean, he was like eight and three before he got hurt or whatever happened. He, he was like, he, they were off to a rip roaring start. And I forgot what happened that season that, that Favre joined the jets before he went to the Vikings and had success. But um, I don't probably know. Probably threw too many interceptions. I want to think that this experiment won't work with Rodgers coming in, but I also have to be a realist and know that he was dealing with a thumb injury last year on his throwing hand, and he was dealing with rookie wide receivers that couldn't consistently catch the ball. Now, part of that's on Rodgers for being a dickhole. He should have showed up to OTAs last year instead of complaining about these new guys. Should have had chemistry developed before they started instead of having to develop that chemistry through the first six weeks, neither here nor there. The fact is Rogers is one of the most talented, if not the most talented throwers in the history of the NFL at quarterback position. So, well, that's why saying, Josh Allen studied him, you know, his mechanics, you ever see how he kind of flings his arm out. He's emulating well, and, what he does. And Aaron Rodgers has a lot of respect for Allen and so much no so doubt. that, if if Allen FaceTimes him, and apparently Rogers is a hard person to get a hold of, you know, the, with if he's not tripping on mushrooms or going on a darkness retreat or <laughs> or blocking you on FaceTime, but when Allen FaceTimes him, apparently he picks up, and maybe it's because of that mutual respect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they did the whole um, the match, the golf match, and and you know they've they've known each other for a while now it's when when you're that good and you're mingling with other pros and you're going to the award ceremonies and stuff you get to know each other and and that's cool i mean i have no problem with that i've always liked aaron Rodgers. obviously he can be a little pompous and have that little smirk when he's winning but when he's losing he's kind of an asshole he's kind of a dick and yeah. people know that he now so was Brady. He holds people accountable, but in a different way. Or Brady was a little whiner, but he got right in your face and told you. Where Rogers just kind of like shuts down and and like kind of just blames. Aggressive. Yeah, he blames other people. Now it, they're both intellectual people, but Aaron Rodgers is way more athletic. And do you ever see his calves? You watch it on uh, Hard yeah. Knocks. That dude's got some calves on him for he a does. quarterback for being kind of thinner, but. Anyway, dude, he plays. Let's... He's a he's an amazing golf player. He's an athlete. He is an athletic individual. The dude could, if the dude put the time he does in the NFL into golf, 
which he probably wouldn't because he'd end up putting his time into becoming the host of Jeopardy. It's but like Steph Curry. You know, if, you put it, both... if you put his full time into golf, I bet he could be semi pro, if not like flirt with trying to make a tournament. He's he is yeah. damn good. Yeah. I mean, there are and a golf, lot of athletes. Golf isn't easy. If anyone, you know, that doesn't play wants to know. Holy cow. They, the pros make it look easy. Like, oh, he just got to chip this out of the sand. Oh, he got this on the rough. I'm gonna, he's going to. And then, you know, obviously that's why Tiger, he made it look so damn easy for so long. Oh, I finally, I played, I played a few rounds on a course in Madison, got my feet wet here in Madison, played, played a couple rounds. Um, How'd that go? Oh man, I, I only went 32 over par. <laughs> That's not bad. Hey, hey, 32. Not bad. So, so wait, did you do nine it's or 18? Only, you can only go up from there. Was it nine or 18? Nine holes. It's 32 over on nine. 32 over on nine. So that. So that's like an average of of like three or four over par each one. Really so like a quadruple, so like said, triple bogey. You know, the only Whatever. way you can go up is hopefully go up from there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay, let's talk about sports books with this. So the Bills are actually a two and a half point favorite going into New Jersey. And uh, what do you think? Do you think that that holds true? Would you would you bet on that or against it? I bet on the. I'm gonna bet on the Bills. I'm not gonna bet. Yeah, you I'll draft Garrett Wilson, but I will draw the fucking line. I'm not. I will bet <laughs> on the Bills. <laughs> okay, so the over and under is 45 and a half, which gets us to our predictions. It's uh, 45 and a half is kind of like a 23 to 22 game. I personally think the Bills pull this one out like 27 20. What do you think? Uh, I'm going to say 31-28 Buffalo. Okay, so a field goal game where I say touchdown. I just feel like uh, Rodgers does not start the season well the last few years. So he, he actually got blown out the last two uh, season openers. Not that that's just going to keep happening, but you know, in 2021, they lost 38-3 to in Green Bay, and then in 2022, they lost 23-8. to so maybe he keeps that trend. Maybe he doesn't. Either way, I think we should not take week one as a litmus test for how the season's going to go. As you know, yeah. last year we started super hot in the first four games. We thought, okay, we're a shoe in for the Super Bowl. And then we had injuries and we had people figure out our offense. I think Dorsey will be a little more a little more creative. Um, Saber, you want to say hi? What's how I've got I'm gonna have Saber say hi. So go ahead. Give him a give him a give him a guest appearance. Here we go. Saber. What's hey, up, bud. Man? Mr. Saber. <laughs> said, named after right. the Buffalo Sabres. Oh, partially. Yeah, I think it's a cool name and it's a it's a French name, S A B R E. Don't, say, don't the spelling. down now. Don't say partially. That was fully based on the Buffalo Sabres. Don't don't don't, don't try to back it down. Was, now. It was paying homage to Buffalo in general and also to the French background which my wife's uh maiden last name is a french name she has obviously ancestors from there so it, you don't it have to try to describe that. in a fancy way why you named him after a hockey team don't it's it, i get it like don't you don't have to explain it it's awesome saber's awesome that's a great name okay so rogers is going to host and and lose by a field goal oh you're waving you still waving you want to sit here I want to see here again. I uh look. I so badly want to like. I want to be a homer jerky. Yeah, he's eating some jerky. Nice. Oh, it's like a jerky stick, like a pepperoni stick almost. There yeah. you go. Um, I'll have some of that. I I, I want to predict the Bills to like shock the world, and after all the the uh, you could say disrespect this off season, blow the Jets out. But man, like again. Being a realist, I think that this game is going to be super close. It could it could be one of those games where if Rod, whoever has it between Rodgers and Allen last type of a game. Uh, that's kind of what my gut's telling me. I hope if, if it end, if I end up being wrong and it ends up being one of those games like we party like we did when we had the perfect game against the Patriots, then I'm all for it. Like that'll be one happy Monday night. But I just yeah, I think it's going to be close. I think that we've got to put our trust in Trey white being back to him, you know, his old self and that our offensive talent can somehow overcome theirs because I think Gabe Davis is going to 
possibly break a thousand yards this year. He's going to be on a on a contract year, and you know, I just think Allen is going to be a little smarter with the ball. Hopefully, you know, it puts a little less pressure on him knowing that we've got the three headed monster for uh, for uh, running backs and you know, good depth. I I'm interested to see what Sherfield and Hardy become because you know they're they're there's something that that uh. I'm gonna sleep okay, on it. <laughs> yeah. So I think that there's a chance that they do very well, but we need to come on strong from the get-go. We do need to watch out for CJ Mosley. Oh, he's getting into my bill stuff. <laughs> um, I do think he's Mosley, grabbing the bats. I know it's empty. We have uh we had he was a wrecking ball against us a couple of years ago, and then he got hurt and was out. But I think if uh Milano can do Milano things and and we just we return to a top five defense and our offense does better with Dorsey knowing how to kind of scheme a little better and be a little more, uh, I guess, unpredictable. Uh, we should be fine. I think that the, the Super Bowl window is still open, but it could be shrinking unless we get past the damn wild card and into the AFC uh, championship again. And then obviously we need to go from there. But uh, Rodgers is going to be no slouch. We know that. A lot of people saw them on hard knocks and they've become a national favorite apparently. But what are you doing? He's throwing the he's throwing the football around. He's getting <laughs> and this was the the ball that uh Brant got us. Uh, yeah, we each got one. So it's shout out to him. It's such an awesome ball. Yeah. Um the he Bills have a lot it. to prove. They have a lot to prove. The the there's gonna be some that say they didn't pay attention to all the offseason slander. Well, most of them did. And there's going to be something to prove on offense. The whole Stefan Diggs and Allen make believe story that there was a rift between them. The, the newcomers that came in between Hardy and Sherfield, the, what are we going to get out of our new middle linebacker to replace Edmonds, Trey white, like the defense being called under McDermott for the first time as a head coach, he's going to call the plays. Like there is so much to prove on both sides of the ball, not to mention any of the other storylines going into Monday night that like, I mean, my God, you could, you could have a whole ledger full of, of the storylines, but look, the team has a lot to prove. He's going, <laughs> he's going, he's going after the helmet in the background. It is now moving <laughs> and don't think it has a mind of its own. Oh, there he goes. He puts it back. Uh, anyway, this the life of a two year old and parents that have to constantly watch him, especially, especially the wifey over here. But, um, we, you know, we've obviously gone past our hour that we're going to do or dedicate to this. I want to do an episode where we break down the entire season. If you want to give maybe your overall quick prediction before we do like a thorough breakdown, um, another time that's fine with me yeah i mean I and i'm fine I, with us not doing a thorough breakdown like doing the week by week yeah. thing it's hard to predict like i think that just given kind of an estimate of like how many wins they're gonna get but um look i i'm, I'm gonna say 12 or 13 wins I'm, I'm i'm i said 13 wins i think when we did our podcast a, a couple months ago um i think 12 or 13 is the sweet range that that i see them if if anything above or below that will shock me yeah i think 13 and 4 12 and 5 is is a good one because there are games that it could obviously be a push it's hard to say uh you know we're we're playing tampa that should be a victory but who the heck knows what they have in in mayfield or trask right I we mean, don't know it, really but seriously though that it, then if, if if okay if allen can't beat baker mayfield or <laughs> i know or i know i know i was being a little facetious there but we still have dallas and we still have to play herbert with the chargers and you know maybe mac jones figures it out maybe because he's now got a like a legit offensive coordinator not a defensive yeah. coordinator making offensive maybe, play calls. maybe i gotta broaden the range a little bit like 11 to 13 wins is the sweet zone anything below 11 or above 13 will shock me kind of a yeah thing. and and we got to play brian dables giants we got to play jacksonville with trevor lawrence who has a good team going on um the commanders are actually selling out because dan snyder's out of there and they have a new owner uh, las vegas sure that's going to be a dumpster fire probably but you just they they have plenty of talent they lost some they don't know what they're going to have in jimmy right now jimmy g 
But our schedule's tough, man. And who knows what Wilson is with Sean Payton? They're, they're, I can go up and down the schedule. Oh, by the way, we still we play both, you know, defending Super Bowl uh, matchups. You know, opponents. We play the the Chiefs and we play the Eagles, and that's sandwiched. They sandwich a bye. So week twelve, Eagles bye. Week thirteen, Jets. Or sorry, Chiefs. We have what six or seven primetime games. I mean. There aren't many uh, one o'clock games on Sunday anymore. We're Thank playing God. a lot of. Thank I know. God, because I'm not going to be getting to see any of those one p.m. games. Yeah, so Greg moved away to Madison, Wisconsin, and he has a a good job. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about it or not, but um, yeah, you're 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 the young guy. You were working on you know gaining some seniority, but <laughs> yeah, I've started. I've started back at the bottom of the totem pole, and now I'm trying to work my way up. And it's going to be a it's going to be a long grind where I'm going to have random days off. None of those, including Saturday, Sundays, for the foreseeable future, um, which is a tough, tough thing for me to do. Um, and I'm going to have to. It, there's should be some gold at the end of the rainbow type of a thing if I can can tough it out. But having to work Saturdays, Sundays for the next six to twelve months at least, it's not something I'm happy about. But, um, but yeah. With that said, uh, thank God we got a lot of primetime games because hopefully I can see that. Oh, nice! You got some. Hey, there we go. Bring, yeah, bring the on. Allen cards in. L let me see if I can get this one. Oh, I I can't do it right now. Hold on, maybe I can. Um, see, hmm. like, I'm seeing a lot of reflection on it. Yeah, you're not gonna be able to see much. Maybe at this level, I can show you. <laughs> this there isn't even go. a card. This is a printout. Yeah, there, but... that's perfect right there. That's the that's yeah. the angle. And and then that one's just probably not gonna show up. Ah, uh, right there a little bit. But this is there one, two, go. three. So one twenty three out of one ninety nine. Do you want to? Do you want to give away a Allen card like um? Yeah. First person that well, we already had a comment, but there is another comment. There's uh, Karuti. Wow, I can't even say it. A Kriti bag Garrett or Kriti bag Garrett? I don't even know. You should just for the, the people for the people that just commented during this live stream. You should send them an Allen card, man. Yeah, I don't think Natalie Forsto, uh cares. She said, "Sorry, dudes, uh, I tuned in for a few minutes and then I had to leave. Keep it up." <laughs> yeah, and then uh, obviously when once this publishes and not just live, Maybe she wants um, an Allen card. Maybe she yeah. does. Yeah. Uh, the only one who got one last year, even though they were, I know I'll send you on one, one, Greg. Okay. Send me an Allen card. <laughs> right. All right. Well, do you have any final words for the, uh, podcast listeners, all 12 of them or 3000 of them, or however many people end up watching and listening? Uh, it's, what do you have for Bill's be, mafia? It's good to be back with you. Even though we're 2000 miles apart, it's good to be back talking Bill's football. Um, it was a long, long off season. I don't know if this off season was longer or the one after 13 seconds. It's really hard for me to um, find an answer to that question. Thank God. I want to see that ball get kicked off Monday night and have a new season and, and um, a chance for a, a new beginning. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm 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 tentatively happy. Like I'm 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 hesitant because all I can think about is how hard it is to win a Super Bowl and everything that's got to go right, and everything that has to go right hasn't gone right for us in the last four or five years. And that's kind of the Buffalo way, though. Like nothing ever goes. It seems nothing ever goes the way you want it to. Um, and I'm hoping that eventually it does because I want to be in Buffalo, New York, drunk out of my mind celebrating a parade through the streets and yeah that, that's, that, that's what everybody wants that's what everybody wants for this city for this fan base for this team for these coaches for this gm we want to have a parade that's gonna go multiple days not just one day and into the night and the next day it's gonna go multiple that's what i want but it's so hard to get there so I'm, I'm, I'm being hesitant, but I, I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to try to be optimistic because that's the only way you can be because being pessimistic sucks. Um, yeah. So, so with that said, uh, Bill's Mafia, pound some Labats, 
jump through some tables responsibly. Don't do it like I did last year where you hit your ass on the cement and still can feel it when you wake up on a certain day. And as always, take a few hydration breaks. All right. Well, that is Greg Ballmer uh, with The House That Ellen Built, Season 2, Episode 1. I'm Scott K. Martin. You've watched The House That Ellen Built. Hopefully, you'll see a full season's worth. Stay tuned maybe on Tuesday or Wednesday for a recap of what happens on Monday night. And we'll catch you next time. Let's go! Let's go, Buffalo! <laughs> Buffalo! <laughs> Done.